This video is part of an audio series featuring the book The Future is Faster Than You Think by Diamandis and Kotler. For more audiobooks, visit my YouTube channel or website for downloads. Chapter 8 The Future of Education The Quest for Quantity and Quality The same technology converging on our movie theaters is heading for our classrooms and just in time. From a macroscopic perspective, education has two main issues, quantity and quality. On the quantity side, we face a catastrophic shortage. In America today, we are in the need of 1.6 million teachers. Globally, the problem is worse. By 2030, UNESCO estimates that the number of teachers will be needed at a shocking 69 million. Nice. As a result, 263 million children worldwide currently lack access to basic education. On the quality side, we face equally difficult challenges. Our modern educational system is anything but. It's an institution created in another time for the needs of a different world. In the mid-18th century, in many ways riding the railroad across America, we spread an industrialized educational system designed to produce a standardized product. Heralded by the bell, students moved from one learning station to the next, while standardized tests ensured quality control. Young minds well prepared for the needs of society. What were those needs? Back then, obedient factory workers. Consider that hallmark of, edu of industrial education, the sage on the stage. The one-size-fits-all model dates to an era when great teachers and good schools were a scarce resource. While economical, a teacher preaching to a classroom filled with students tends to divide pupils into two dispirited groups, those who are lost and those who are bored. This problem has been compounded by quality control gone wild, teachers being forced to teach the test, students standardized like never before. Sadly, what we are actually testing is a very narrow bandwidth of skills, many of which have nothing to do with the needs of adult life. Point of fact, when was the last time you factored a polynomial? Batch processing children is both an industrial hangover and an educational disaster because of basic biology. Everyone is wired differently. Some of this is nature, some nurture, but the end result is the same. We are individuals, and there's no standard set of engaging experiences that can maximize learning for all. Put these problems together, and this helps explain why a 2015 study by the United States Department of Education found that some 7,000 students drop out of high school every day, or one student drops out every 26 seconds. That's 1.2 million students a year, with more than half of those dropouts citing boredom as the number one reason that they left. But converging technology offers a host of new solutions to the challenges of quality and quantity. Every technology that's currently making an impact on entertainment is doing double duty in education, meaning, as we will see in a moment, one size fits all is no match for the App Store. Example, 1 billion Android teachers per year. In 2012, Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of MIT's Media Lab, dropped off a bunch of solar charging systems and a pile of Motorola Zoom tablets in a pair of remote Ethiopian villages. The tablets were preloaded with basic learning games, movies, books, and the like, then sealed inside of boxes. Rather than being handed to the adults, the sealed boxes were given directly to the children. These kids could neither read nor write. They had never seen this kind of technology before. Nobody was given instructions. Negroponte's question was simple. What happens next? For decades, Negroponte has been trying to answer this question. He's been the leading voice for an unusual idea. That children, armed only with a laptop, preloaded with educational apps and games, could teach themselves to read and write while also learning how to navigate the internet. Years later, to advance this cause, he'd founded a nonprofit called One Laptop Per Child, with the goal of building a $100 laptop computer that could be put into the hands of children in need. Still, questions remained. Was a cheap tablet sufficient to solve this problem? 
How much teaching and direction would kids actually need? Could children teach themselves simply by playing with the apps and games? The Ethiopian experiment was meant to answer those questions, which it did, and then some. I thought the kids would play with the boxes, Negropont told the MIT Review. Within four minutes, one kid not only opened the box, but also found the on-off switch and powered it up. Within five days, they were using 47 apps per child per day. Within two weeks, they were singing ABC songs in the village, and within five months, they had hacked the Android operating system. Certainly, learning to read by computer is not a new idea. In the other book, Abundance, we explored research conducted by Sugata Mitra, a professor of educational technology at Newcastle University. Mitra's work shows that functional illiteracy is not a barrier to computer literacy. In his studies, children in India's slums were given access to a net-connected computer. Very quickly, they learned to use the equipment, surf the web, and teach themselves the basics of reading and writing. Negropont's Ethiopia experiment went further. What excited the one laptop per child team was how the tablets unlocked self-directed learning and creativity, and more importantly, how technologically sophisticated the kids had to become, on their own, to unlock those skills in the first place. The kids had completely customized the desktop, Ed McNerney, the, profit's CT, the nonprofit's CTO, told the MIT Review. So every kid's tablet looked different. We had installed software to prevent them from doing that. And the fact that they worked around it was clearly the kind of creativity, the kind of inquiry, and the kind of discovery that we think is essential to learning. In 2017, the XPRIZE decided to take things to the next level, launching the $15 million Global Learning XPRIZE. Principally funded by Elon Musk, in partnership with Google, the prize was a software development challenge aimed at the 263 million children in the world without access to a school. To claim it, a team had to develop Android-based software that would allow a child to quickly self-educate with nothing more than a tablet that is, learn the basics of reading and writing. In Swahili, as Tanzania was where the winning software would be tested, and math in under 18 months. The competition attracted about 700 teams from around the globe. Nearly 200 delivered software, and out of this pool, five finalists were selected and each received a million dollars for their software to be loaded onto some 5,000 Pixel C tablets donated by Google. In partnership with the World Food Program, XPRIZE identified some 2,400 illiterate children in 167 different ultra-remote villages in Tanzania. These villages had neither schools nor literate adults. They then installed solar chargers to charge the tablets, pre-tested the children to benchmark progress, and distributed the tablets. In May of 2019, two teams split the final $10 million purse. Kit Kit School from South Korea, and One Billion from Kenya. Both had created software that, in an hour a day, produced an educational equivalent to what those children would have received attending a Tanzanian school on a full-time basis. Per the rules of the competition, the software produced by all five finalists, including the two winning teams, has to be open-sourced, and it's available for free on GitHub. For this software to become a real weapon in the fight against illiteracy, there is also the issue of getting a tablet into the hands of any child in need, or adult for that matter. But that's the real goal of the prize. If this self-education software comes pre-installed on every Android phone and tablet, then when you're ready to replace your device, you can instead donate it to charity. You help the environment by recycling, and you help society by empowering a child. In a very real sense, you are donating a teacher. And with over a billion Android handsets manufactured every year, this software could make a serious dent in what has to be the single greatest squandering of talent in history, the 263 million young minds that need our help. The Ultimate Field Trip History Class, 2030 This week's lesson, Ancient Egypt the pharaohs, the queens, the tombs, the full tut. Sure, you'd love to see the pyramids in person, but the cost of airfare, 
hotel rooms for the entire class, taking two weeks off from school for the trip, none of these things are feasible. Yet, even if you could go, you couldn't go. Many of Egypt's tombs are closed for repairs and definitely off limits to a group of teenagers. Not to worry, virtual reality solves these problems. In regular, in regular reality, Queen Nefertari's resting place sits in the Valley of the Queens, not that civilians ever get to look inside. To preserve the relics, the tomb has been shuttered to the public for decades. In a virtual reality world, though, you and your classmates can easily visit the burial chamber, trace the hieroglyphics, even check out her sarcophagus up close. You also have a world-class Egyptologist as a tour guide, telling you, if you turn your attention to the filigree at the back of the tomb, you will notice a sculpture of Osiris, the Egyptian god of la 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 da But turning your attention to the back of the tomb doesn't require waiting until 2030. In 2018, Philip Rodesdale and his team at High Fidelity pulled off this exact virtual field trip. First, they 3D laser scanned every square inch of Queen Nefertari's tomb. They also shot thousands of high-resolution photos of the burial chamber. By stitching together more than 10,000 photos into a single vista, then laying that vista atop their 3D scanned map, Rosedale created a stunningly accurate visual tomb. Virtual tomb. Next, he gave a classroom full of kids HTC Vive virtual reality headsets. Because High Fidelity is a social VR platform, meaning multiple people can share the same virtual space at the same time, the entire class was able to explore that tomb together. In total, for their fully immersive trip to Egypt, zero travel time, zero travel expenses. This was a rich learning experience for the kids who took the trip. Research shows that multi-sensory learning trumps other forms, even if we do that learning in virtual reality. This means the technology allows us to create an infinite variety of immersive, high-quality teaching environments. Yet this is only where we are today. Tomorrow? Well, many experts think that education could be VR's killer app. More likely, it will be a combination of virtual reality and augmented or and artificial intelligence. Here is one reason why. Remember the virtual Tony Robbins we mentioned in the last chapter? The same neural nets that enable LifeKind to duplicate the renowned life coach allow us to duplicate anyone. Want to check out ancient Greece? Not only do you get every Doric column, but you also get, get a bearded gentleman in a white toga greeting you as you step in. Hello, I'm Plato. Let's tour my academy. As cool as it might sound to learn ethics from the guy who invented ethics, virtual reality can actually take this farther. Jeremy Balenson, the director of Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, who we met in Chapter 3, has spent the past 16 years studying VR's ability to expand empathy, the emotional foundation of ethics. In that time, he discovered that VR can quickly and significantly shift our attitudes and actions toward everything from homelessness to climate change to racial prejudice. Spend time in the VR world as an elderly homeless woman, and the amount of empathy you feel for the homeless will significantly increase. And that increase remains once you exit the virtual world. The technology doesn't just change how we feel and act in the virtual, but how we feel and act in the actual. In other words, virtual reality unlocks the possibility of an entirely different kind of moral education. Nor is empathy the only emotion virtual reality appears capable of training. In research conducted at USC, psychologist Skip Rizzo has had considerable success using virtual reality to treat PTSD in soldiers. Other scientists have extended this to the full range of anxiety disorders. When you put all of this together, virtual reality, especially when combined with artificial intelligence, has the potential to facilitate a top-shelf traditional education, plus all the empathy and emotional skills that traditional education has long been lacking. Most crucially, when AI and VR converge with wireless 5G networks, our global education problem moves from the nearly impossible challenge of recruiting teachers and funding schools for the hundreds of millions in need, 
to the much more manageable puzzle of building a fantastic virtual educational system that we can give away for free to anyone with a headset. It's quality and quantity on demand. School 2030 It's 2030 and school is in session. Only what does school in 2030 actually look like? Turns out, our first glance at that future actually arrived in 1995, when science fiction author Neil Stevenson published the novel The Diamond Age. This coming-of-age story is set in a neo-Victorian future, where nanotechnology and artificial intelligence are woven into the fabric of everyday life, and education is handled by the book, that is, by the Young Woman's Illustrated Primer. The primer is an AI-driven, individually customized learning companion disguised as a book. The book answers questions in a contextually relevant and engaging fashion. Packed with sensors that monitor everything from energy levels to emotional state, the primer creates a rich learning environment aimed at producing a specific transformation. Rather than molding children to the needs of society, the primer has more humanist aims, to produce strong, independent, empathetic, and creative thinkers. As it turns out, Stevenson is now the chief futurist at Magic Leap, helping use augmented reality to birth his illustrated primer, version 1.0. Magic Leap's technology allows you to place holograms in the world around you. Concepts that are difficult to visualize via a 2D screen, such as human anatomy, come alive in this 3D world. Imagine a virtual autopsy, being able to strip away layers of skin or muscle inside a navigable operating room. The experience of learning in a 3D environment is a rich one, making it much more likely to cross the bridge from short-term into long-term memory. But the real magic of augmented reality is that it extends the classroom into the world. With the mix of AR and AI, every walk could become a history lesson. Amble the streets of Manhattan, for example, and you can see the buildings as they were a century ago, complete with holographic Victorians serving as virtual historians. Of course, augmented reality alone doesn't get us to the primer, but if we couple it to ongoing convergences, the picture becomes cl more clear. Today's artificial intelligence revolution gives us another component, the ability to create individually customized learning environments. Add in sensors that respond to neurophysiological data so students can, for one example, keep themselves in a growth mindset, which research shows is needed for learning. Or, to offer a second example, push themselves toward a flow state, which research shows can amplify learning. Put it all together, and we start to see a very different future, one of distributed, individually customizable, accelerated learning environments. So what is school like in 2030? Well, the first question you have to answer is, what would you like to learn today? Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.